Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and on behalf of the Southeast Asia Cultural Heritage Alliance, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, our next chat time um, for today. And uh, I'm Dr. Natalie Pang. Um, I'm uh, part of uh, CCHA and also uh, ex-co member at the Singapore Heritage Society. Uh, before we start, uh, before I introduce Dr. Jack Lee, who will be uh, doing his uh, talk with us today, uh, may I invite uh, Ms. Katrini uh, Kubontubu to um, uh, introduce us to uh, CCHA. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today and still virtually. So we are very pleased to be able to welcome those of you in this uh, April chat time with Sicha. The topic of sense of place is really related with the current issue in heritage conservation for both in Asian countries and other Western part of the world. Since the last celebration of the World Heritage Day, on 18 April 2021 this year, we acknowledge further there, it still was a, a shifting paradigm to redefine authenticity from physical things to more intangible things. So we will welcome uh, Jack Lee in today's chat time with very enthusiastic to understand more about the intersection between brute heritage and intangible cultural heritage in Singapore. And for our information, Jack Lee is our founding members of SICA. And then allow me to introduce Sicha as uh, the organizer of this chat time. So uh, Sicha is an acronym of Southeast Asian Cultural Heritage Alliance. It is a digital-based network of Southeast Asian civil society organization engaged in cultural heritage conservation work. And there are seven countries as founding members of the embryo of the Sicha. The first one is Thailand, uh, represents by this Siam Society and the Royal Patronage. We have also Malaysia represented by Penang Heritage Trust. We have Burma represented by Yangon Heritage Trust. And we have Philippines through Heritage Conservation Society of the Philippines. And of course, we have Singapore represented by Singapore Heritage Society, where we have Jack Lee and also Natalie Pan there. And uh, we have Vietnam represent by Center for Research and Promotion of Cultural Heritage of Vietnam, where uh, we also have uh, Mr. Tang as the chair of this SICA uh, organization. So, and then the last but not least is also Indonesia, represented by BPPI, or we call it BPPI, the Indonesian Heritage Trust, where I am a president of it since uh, 2013. So on this uh, 2021 onward, CICA is also to complete legal registration. And in this conjunction, we invite uh, other Asian civil society organization and also NGO to join the CICA. There are Laos, there are Brunei, and then also Cambodia local organization will also be part of our funding members. And uh, if I may also continuing with the three object uh, the objective from SICA, which comprises of, uh, we intend to promote the effective government's community partnership in cultural heritage management. And then uh, our objective is also to strengthen the Asian social cultural community as a people's uh, center third pillar of Asia. And then the last one is to give organizational expression to the Asian Declaration on Cultural Heritage emphasize on creative communities of human person. So these three objectives expressed in our missions, which consisted to be a forum for robust discourse of every heritage, also be a think tank and resource center supporting Asians and the decision maker in heritage and policy in Asia, and also be a responsible locally based and advocate to propose development of heritage management program in Asia. And since its establishment in the October 2019, we conduct several activities that namely digital monthly talk named chat time that's a today program we had since october 2020 and continue until today which happened in once a month and we have a second program the capacity building in heritage management clinic uh, in pilot case study of siak city in indonesia and pro city in thailand for the year 2020 until 2021 this year so that's all about us once again on behalf of SICA and as its vice chairpersons, I hope this chat time today will be benefit to all of you. 
and I heard that there is an overwhelming amount of, uh, of registered attendees. So thank you for this overwhelming response and enjoy the chat time. So stay safe, stay healthy, everyone. I also wish uh, all of you having a, wonder, a wonderful fasting break later in this afternoon for our uh, Muslim friends around the, around the Asian countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katrini, for the welcome remarks. Um, and I should also mention that uh, Katrina is also president of the Indonesian Heritage Trust and uh, vice president of uh, the CICHA Board of Directors. Um, so thank you very much for the comprehensive introduction uh, to um, CICHA and CHA time. Uh, now we've heard of the terms uh, tangible and intangible heritage. Uh, you, you've heard of uh, these uh, terms, uh, you know, in your everyday life, in the uh, articles you read, uh, but what is the intersection? What, are, what is the relationship or even the difference between those? Uh, so we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Jack Lee, who is president of the Singapore Heritage Society, uh, to explore, um, yeah, to explore this uh, uh, differences as well as uh, the intersections uh, with us and yeah um, while we are waiting right uh, Jack do you mind uh, sharing your video okay sorry something happened with my video just now not sure why um, but yeah uh, while Jack is actually sharing his video uh, his uh, topic is titled uh, his talk is titled sense of place the intersection between built heritage and intangible cultural heritage in Singapore. So uh, the, his talk will last about 45 minutes. And while his talk is going on, right, um, the Q&A button is available to all of you at the bottom or the top of your screen. So if you have a question, please feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A uh, box, right? Uh, we will uh, attend to your questions um, after uh, 45 minutes during the Q&A session. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, may I uh, invite all of you to um, welcome Jack to start his talk. Hello, everybody. Uh, glad you can join us today. So what I'm going to be talking about is the intersection between built heritage and intangible cultural heritage. And I'm going to use Singapore as an example, but of course, hopefully we can all learn lessons that would apply to our own countries. So I will talk a little bit about how intangible cultural heritage can help to preserve built heritage, uh, both in international law and in domestic law. Um, conversely, I will also talk about how built heritage can help to safeguard intangible cultural heritage as well. I'll say a little bit about heritage, climate change and climate uh, resilience. And then I will conclude with some potential challenges that we'll all need to think about. So first I'm going to talk about some international law aspects. Uh, Singapore was a member of UNESCO between 1965 and 1985, and then it left. So the official reason that was given was that uh, Singapore was then um, uh, uh, not getting a lot of benefit out of UNESCO and having to uh, pay a lot of money to UNESCO. So it uh, uh, decided that it was not very worth it for it to stay in UNESCO. But what had happened at that time was that um, some major countries like the US and UK had actually also withdrawn from UNESCO. Uh, it seems because of some um, unhappiness about how the organization was managed. Um, so we don't know whether that's the real reason why Singapore also decided to, to leave. But in any case, some of these problems were sorted out um, in the past. And uh, both UK and US rejoined. And so Singapore also decided to rejoin in 2007. And shortly after that, it uh, became a party to the World Heritage Convention. Uh, this happened for Singapore in 2012. And we had our first World Heritage Site, which is our Singapore Botanic Gardens, listed on the World Heritage Register in 2015. So the next major piece of uh, convention that Singapore joined was the UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage, and Singapore joined in 2018. This is a very widely accepted convention. Um, as of last year, there were 180 countries that were members of this convention. So it's like pretty much almost every single member of the UN is, is uh, a party to this convention. And this convention actually tries to define what intangible cultural heritage is. So I thought it would be useful for us to have a look at that. So it defines it as the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, skills, as well as the instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural spaces 
associated therewith that communities, groups, and in some cases, individuals recognize as part of their cultural heritage. This intangible cultural heritage transmitted from generation to generation is constantly recreated by communities and groups in response to their environment, their interaction with nature and the history and provides them with a sense of identity and continuity, thus promoting respect for cultural diversity and human creativity. So it's quite a comprehensive kind of uh, definition. So what is interesting to note is that ICH is a response to the environment and it embraces cultural spaces that are associated with practices, expressions, and so on. So not only are we talking about certain art forms, uh, certain practices, but it could even encompass the place where these things happen. I mean, and that, of course, is, is the intersection between uh, built heritage and ICH. And state parties are obliged to take necessary measures to safeguard, of course, such cultural spaces. Uh, there's another scheme that's run by UNESCO, and it is called the Masterpieces of Oral and Intangible Heritage of Humanity Program. This is the program that existed before the uh, ICH Convention came into force. And at that time, they had already defined a cultural space as a place in which popular and traditional cultural activities are concentrated. But it can also be a time generally characterized by a certain periodicity, cyclical, seasonal, calendar, etc., or by an event. So the idea is that a cultural space could be a place, a physical place, but it could also be, let's say, a time of year. So let's say that a particular ritual happens in spring every year, then that could also be a place in such and, and protectable as such. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so two authors, Deacon and Beasley, have said that ICH includes social and spiritual associations symbolic meanings and memories associated with objects and places. Tangible heritage forms all gain meaning through intangible practice, use and interpretation. The intangible can only be interpret, sorry, the tangible can only be interpreted through the intangible. And I think this is a very important idea. If you have a place like a historic building, it really has significance not so much because of the building itself and the design of the building, that's part of it, but it's also very important about the cultural connections, the intangible connections on how the building was used, uh, what went on there, that really makes it very rich. So I think that's something we, we need to bear in mind. The tangible heritage really gains its meaning a lot of the time through intangible cultural heritage. And you will see that this interconnectedness between ICH and built heritage is also emphasized by UNESCO's recommendation on the historic urban landscape. So this recommendation defines the historic urban landscape as including social and cultural practices and values, economic processes, and the intangible dimensions of heritage as related to diversity and identity. So I want to give an example of how this interconnectedness might work. Um, I'm going to talk about a historic cemetery in Singapore, which is called Bukit Brown Cemetery. And it's actually connected with another cemetery called the Seong Cemetery next to it, but I'm just going to call, call them collectively as Bukit Brown Cemetery. It is thought to be the largest Chinese cemetery outside China itself. It was used between the 19th century and 1973 when it was closed for burials because it was uh, full. And it contains, uh, it is thought, some 100,000 graves. So it's quite a big uh, cemetery. And there are many well-known members of the Chinese community buried there, uh, but also people who were paupers, people who, who didn't have a lot of money and couldn't really afford to, to have a, a big tomb, they're also buried there. And it was a battle zone during World War II, and therefore it is also a place where you will find unmarked war graves which have not yet been found. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> So you could say that what is some of the intangible cultural heritage that's associated with the cemetery? Well, it can include things like the design, the ornamentation, and the orientation of tombs according to Chinese feng shui principles, uh, rituals that are carried out every year at the cemetery to honor the dead, especially the tomb sweeping ceremonies during the Qingming festival, which is traditionally held in the spring, and even tomb inscriptions, which are a source of genealogical and historical information about both uh, prominent pioneers as well as ordinary people who are buried in the cemetery. 
So here are some pictures. This is, uh, I suppose, one of the tombs that you might see in, in the cemetery. Um, it is probably a tomb of, of, a, of a person who came from a fairly wealthy family, as you can see from the very rich carving uh, on the tomb itself. Um, the carvings that you see often uh, depict stories from traditional Chinese uh, culture. And uh, you will see also there's a statue of a, a jade maiden on the right hand side. So this was believed to be a, a mythological feature of a, a mythological character that would um, guide the deceased soul to the afterlife. And this is a different tomb. You can see that the tombs have such features as uh, tiles, and these were often imported all the way from Europe for use uh, in the cemetery. Uh, you will see that some of these pillars on the sides have Chinese uh, sayings carved on them and uh, the lion uh, uh, guardian as well, a statue of a little lion to guard the tomb. And uh, that bulbous thing on the side, this one is, is actually um, uh, a lotus flower. So one of the interesting and maybe unique features of uh, the tombs in the cemetery are these guards. And these guards are actually not Chinese. They are sepoys, they are Indian soldiers. Um, and you may wonder why there are Indian soldiers guarding the tombs in a Chinese cemetery. Well, um, Singaporeans were quite used to seeing uh, people of Indian origin working in the police and the armed forces. And so I suppose uh, they kind of naturally thought that this guardian role would continue in, in the afterlife, you know? And so I think it's something that you definitely would not see, for example, in China. This is uh, not a tomb. This is actually an altar uh, to the earth god. And a lot of the tombs have a small altar on the side uh, to enable people who visit the tomb to make some prayers to the earth god and ask for permission to visit the tomb. Uh, and, and this shows the connection between um, culture, religious uh, beliefs, and the cemetery itself. And finally, this is a picture of a tomb that has been visited during the Qingming or Tomb Sweeping Festival. So it is traditional for some people to put pieces of colored paper on the, the mound behind the tomb uh, to show that they have been to visit their deceased relative and, and they've uh, burnt some incense. You can see like uh, uh, joss sticks in the joss stick holder um, to, to pray to their ancestors and also to the earth goddess here, yeah, the earth god. Okay, so what has happened uh, recently is that the government has built a four lane highway across part of the cemetery. And this resulted in the loss of about 5,000 tombs. So the government has said that eventually the rest of the cemetery will probably need to be cleared, possibly in as little as 10 years to make way for housing. Um, at the moment, we don't know exactly when this is going to happen. The government said they don't have a, a, a date yet, but it's likely that this is going to happen at some stage. And as a result, the cemetery was placed on the 2014 World Monuments Watch List of Cultural Heritage Sites at Risk. So when it was announced that the government will be nominating the Botanical Gardens as Singapore's first World Heritage Site, some people also said we should nominate this uh, historic Bukit Brown Cemetery uh, as a World Heritage Site as well. Uh, the government's response was that um, none of its stakeholders had suggested that the cemetery should be nominated in this way, but it would study how it could be preserved, taking into account future development plans. So um, it's, uh, you know, it's quite a big answer. We don't really know what will happen in the years to come. Uh, but what you could say, perhaps, is that this sort of uh, intangible cultural heritage that I mentioned that's associated with the cemetery, or the cemetery itself as a cultural space, could be uh, worthy of protection under the uh, cultural in its intangible cultural heritage convention. So um, an example that might be similar is the Jama'a al Fana Square, and this is in Marrakesh in Morocco. And it is inscribed on the register for having a concentration of musical, religious, and artistic expressions. So essentially, this is like a market square in Marrakesh, and a lot of uh, cultural activities take place there. Uh, apart from, I guess, buying and selling of things, you also have people performing music, performing religious um, per, uh, ceremonies, uh, uh, artistic, um, uh, cer uh, artistic. Uh, activities and so on. And therefore that was enough for the uh, uh, square as a whole to be 
put on the register as a cultural space. So in a sense, you could also say this might apply to other situations, perhaps like the cemetery as well. So safeguarding the um, intangible cultural heritage that relates to the cemetery would therefore justify uh, preserving the cemetery itself, maybe as a, a cultural space under the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention, or maybe as a World Heritage Site. But of course, at the moment, um, there's no indication that uh, this is being proposed or going to be done at all. I want to also just mention another scheme that's run by UNESCO, and this is called Memory of the World. Memory of the World is not a convention, it's just a program that is, that is run by uh, UNESCO. And the vision of the Memory of the World program is that the world's documentary heritage belongs to all, should be fully preserved and protected, and given uh, and with due recognition of cultural mores and practicalities, should be permanently accessible to all without hindrance. So the idea is that um, uh, they want to come up with a list of all the documents in the world that are deemed to be historically and heritage uh, important from a heritage basis and put it on a list and hopefully people will, will come to know about them and be interested in them and and hopefully that it will they will be protected as well what is interesting about this scheme is that unlike the world heritage scheme as well as the intangible cultural heritage scheme uh, where nominations have to be made by the governments of states Nominations for the Memory of the World program can actually be made by individuals and NGOs. So it's, it's, it's different. Any one of you can like log on to the website and, and uh, I think submit an application if you, if you want to. So documentary heritage, which I guess is a kind of intangible cultural heritage, could include inscriptions on stele. Stele are uh, large stone blocks. So one interesting question we could ask ourselves is whether epigraphs or inscriptions on tombstones in Bukit Brown Cemetery would qualify as documentary heritage. Um, you could compare two examples which are on the memory of the world register. Uh, in the Temple of Literature in Hanoi in Vietnam, 82 stone stele have information about the laureates of the royal examinations that were held between 1442 and 1779. So this is a list of names of, of people who sat for the royal examinations in the past. Um, and these are actually on the memory of the World Register as a kind of document. Another example comes from Myanmar. So the Kutador inscription shrines in Mandalay in Myanmar contain 729 slabs. And on these slabs, you will find the Buddhist uh, Tipitaka, the scriptures being carved on the slabs. And these slabs are then housed inside these uh, little white shrines that you see in the upper photograph. So these are also uh, deemed to be documentary uh, uh, um, her heritage that is put onto this memory of the world register. So it's interesting to consider whether um, the inscriptions on tombstones might also qualify for that. Okay, I'm going to say something now about uh, domestic law, which is uh, uh, fo uh, focusing on Singapore law. And this is to, to see how this interaction between intangible cultural heritage and built heritage is also given some recognition in, in domestic law. So first I'm going to uh, uh, try and answer the question, how can intangible cultural heritage help to protect built heritage? Um, I think that the interconnectedness is also reflected in domestic law. And in Singapore, we protect our built heritage through two pieces of legislation. The first is the Planning Act. And what uh, can happen under the Planning Act is that areas in Singapore can be declared as conservation areas. Then we have an act called the Preservation of Monuments Act and preservation orders can be made to preserve certain sites as national monuments. First, let's look at the Planning Act. So under the Planning Act, where the Minister for National Development feels that any area is of special architectural, historic, traditional, or aesthetic interest, uh, he or she can approve a proposal to amend the master plan to designate the area as a conservation area. And uh, once an area is designated as a conservation area, the Urban Redevelopment Authority or URA's permission must be obtained to carry out or permit the carrying out of works within a conservation area. And the, the term works is very wide. It not only includes development of land, sort of like construction of a building and, and renovation of a building, um, but it even includes external or internal decorative painting or other works to the building within an area which may affect its character or appearance. So the idea is that um, in general, 
if you want to um, do any kind of development, uh, build a new building, like knock down an old building, build a new building, or even to just renovate a building, you need permission. But if it's in a conservation area, even if you're just changing the color of the paint on the outside from blue to pink, you will need permission for that. It's a higher level of protection because uh, if you do something like change the color or change the external uh, decoration on the building, what that can happen is that it would change the, the character of the building and it will look very strange in the district and so on. And that is the whole idea behind uh, requiring special permission for that because it's a conservation area. So according to the master plan's written statement, when deciding whether conservation permission should be granted to the owner of the building, the URA will take into consideration various planning guidelines, for example, guidelines relating to how the building can be used, the form of the building, the urban design of the area, the size of the plot size of the building, um, and any specific uh, conservation guidelines that it has issued. So it, it needs to consider all these things before deciding whether to give permission to the person or not. Now let's look at the, uh, the other scheme, which is the National Monument Scheme. The National Monument Scheme is run by a different agency called the National Heritage Board. And one of the board's functions is to identify monuments that are of such historic, cultural, traditional, archaeological, architectural, artistic, or symbolic significance and national uh, importance as to be worthy of preservation under this act. Uh, and to make recommendations to the minister for the preservation under this act of these monuments that have been identified. So once uh, a, a site has been declared to be a national monument, um, the owner or occupier is required to take all reasonable measures to ensure that the national monument is properly maintained at all times in accordance with the guidelines uh, that are issued by the board. And if let's say the uh, building is not being well maintained, the National Heritage Board can actually issue what is known as a preservation notice requiring the owner to uh, take, carry out works to preserve, maintain or repair the site at the owner's expense. Uh, someone has asked like, what if the owner can't afford this? Well, there is some funding that is available from the board, but I, my understanding is that uh, it is not enough to cover the entire cost. Usually you would have to try and raise funds uh, on your own to, to carry out this um, uh, res, uh, the preservation or uh, renovation works or maintenance works and so on. So um, again, if you're going to do any work on a national monument, you will need to get the board's prior written approval and the board can in fact impose conditions on what you can or cannot do uh, as part of the works uh, as it thinks necessary to protect this national monument. And this can uh, include requiring the work to be carried out to certain specifications and to restore the site if the works cause some damage. So although you, you will see that the two acts don't go into a lot of detail, presumably um, any uh, intangible cultural heritage that relates to a site would be taken to, into account when deciding whether to declare a site to be either a conservation area or a national monument. Um, it's not very clear because the schemes at the moment don't involve a lot of public participation. The government is not actually obliged by law to conduct heritage impact assessments on the sites before doing any approvals or even to disclose uh, any such assessments if they have been carried out. Um, I would say that at the moment, preservation of built heritage in Singapore is largely carried out on a, on a top-down basis. It's decided by the government um, um, very much. And incidents such as the building of the road through Bukit Brown Cemetery sometimes have given rise to a sense that the government is a bit reluctant to consult the public before taking action. Uh, so we understand that an environmental impact assessment or EIA was conducted uh, on, on the cemetery site before the road was built. But uh, to date, the government has not released this, so we don't really know what it says. Um, however, I think things are changing. Um, in more recent years, when, uh, whenever there's been a, a kind of a project that has affected um, environment, environmental heritage or built heritage, the government has uh, done more consultation and has also released more information. So uh, in contrast to the situation involving Bukit Brown, uh, we can look at the Cross Island Mass Rapid Transit Line. So this is a new uh, underground train line that is proposed to be built uh, across the island from east to west. Um, the government has actually conducted two Environmental, uh, environmental impact assessments. And what is different from the uh, Bukit Brown Cemetery case is that it has made these public. They are available on the website uh, and they're very long, uh, thousands of pages long if you want to have a look at it. Um, and, and I think the reason why they decided to do so is that 
part of this um, train line is due to run under the central catchment nature reserve. So it's going to cut through part of one of our nature reserves, which of course um, then means that it's going to be some damage to the nature reserve there. And I think that the fact that they have conducted these EIAs and made them available for the public to look at means that there's greater transparency. And I think this is to be welcome. Um, and it provides a lot of relevant background information so that people can better understand and, and evaluate the issues that involved and so on. Um, so what has happened is that the government, after studying uh, the environmental impact and talking to um, groups such as the Nature Society and other interested parties, they have decided not to reroute the route, the, the, the line, sorry. Um, and it, therefore, the line is going to cut through part of the reserve. Fortunately, it's only one corner of the reserve. And the line is an underground line, which means that on the surface after the construction is completed, you probably won't be able to see anything. It will still look like a forest. The main um, damage that will be done probably will be during the construction process where there will be disruption on the surface. Um, but even though the decision didn't go the way the uh, Nature Society NGO uh, wanted, I think that the fact that there was public consultation and engagement is again to be welcomed. Um, even if the final decision doesn't go the way of, of what people hope for, at least they feel that their views have been heard and considered, and they are more likely to then accept the final decision that has been made. So now I'm going to look at how uh, built heritage, in a sense, can help to protect intangible cultural heritage. So it's the other way around, right? Um, currently, in Singapore, we don't have a domestic law that protects intangible cultural heritage. Um, we do have, uh, so, so one question that is raised is whether we should actually have a statute uh, like what Japan has for the protection of cultural property. So what happens in Japan under this um, uh, statute is that they can declare uh, certain practitioners of intangible cultural heritage to be national cultural treasures and you know, gives them a special status and all that. So what we've done in Singapore is even though we don't have a statute for that, we do have um, a, an award scheme that's run by our National Heritage Board um, called the Stewards of Intangible Cultural Heritage. And they try and identify people who practice various types of ICH. And then um, if they show that they uh, are active practitioners and are helping to carry on the, train younger people to carry on their skills and so on, then they get an award and then and they get some financial support as well. So I think it's, it's something similar to what Japan is doing. Um, but uh, currently, we don't have any specific laws that relate to that. But nonetheless, how can built heritage, in a sense, protect intangible cultural heritage? Uh, and I think one way in this is that there could be restrictions on how national monuments and conservation areas can be used in order to safeguard any ICH that's associated with them. So the example I'm going to give is a building called Chimes Hall in Singapore. Chimes Hall was formerly a Christian chapel of a school called the Convent of the Holy Infant Jesus. It's a Catholic school. And um, the school used to be in the center of town, but it uh, moved away. And then the site was deconsecrated and declared to be a national monument in 1990. So the hall in the, the, sorry, the chapel in the center, which is now Chimes Hall, is a national monument. There are other buildings and a wall around the chapel, and these are conservation areas. So this is a site which is both a national monument and the conservation area parts of it. So the Chimes complex is no longer used as a religious building. It is now, um, uh, and it's kind of like an entertainment area. It's got shops, it's got restaurants, it's got pubs and so on. And the hall can be rented for functions such as weddings and what the Chimes website calls corporate events. So um, this is what the chapel looks like. Uh, Chimes Hall, right? And you can see other buildings, those are parts of the conservation area. And uh, this is the interior. So in 2012, uh, some complaints were actually made to the police and various government departments about an event that was called the Chapel, uh, sorry, the Escape Chapel Party that was going to be held on Holy Saturday. Holy Saturday is the day that is between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And both of these days are very significant festivals in the Christian calendar. Um, so for some reason, I don't know whether it was by chance or deliberate, the organizers of this party decided to hold it on Holy Saturday. 
And in promotional material, the organizers said it would be a sacrilegious night of partying and included photographs of women dressed in skimpy nuns' costumes. And I actually went online. Nothing ever disappears online. You can find these pictures online, right? So this was the poster for the, for the event. Um, and they even had people dressed up in sexy nuns' costumes to promote the event. Um, and you can see how if you were a uh, Catholic, you would not be very happy about this, obviously. So the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Singapore, uh, whose uh, official residence happens to be directly opposite Chimes Hall, <laughs> unfortunately, said that this event was totally scandalous to the church. And in the end, the organizers canceled the event and said, we are really sorry for any offense that has been caused. But it makes you wonder whether selected heritage buildings maybe should have some kind of condition that is put on their use uh, to preserve people's cultural memory of the building's significance and therefore safeguard the ICH. So this building, although it was no longer a Christian church, nonetheless, people remember it as a church. That's the, the um, intangible cultural heritage associated with it. So you could see how people could be very upset if it was used for a purpose which they thought was incompatible with the original ICH associated with the building. Um, okay, so I'm going to now talk a little bit about heritage and its relation to climate change and climate resilience, which is, I think, one of the themes that we have been uh, dealing with in, in this series of Cha Time. So uh, in Singapore in February, the Singapore Parliament passed a motion and this motion states that this house acknowledges that climate change is a global emergency and a threat to mankind and calls on the government in partnership with the private sector, civil society, and the people of Singapore to deepen and accelerate efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change and to embrace sustainability in the development of Singapore. So this is significant. It's the first time uh, uh, such a motion has been passed to recognize that climate change is real, it is an emergency, and we all need to think about how what we can do about it. So we need to think about the relationship between heritage and climate change. Uh, scientists predict that climate change will lead to, among other things, uh, severe hurricanes and other types of storms, like tornadoes in some countries and all that, uh, may lead to longer periods of drought in some countries, um, and extreme hot or cold temperatures. And we've already seen some of this happen, for example, in Australia and in other places. So where built heritage is concerned, um, to help to reduce climate change, some of the things that we might want to start thinking about would be, for example, reducing our carbon footprint. And this could be done by renovating old buildings, some of which could have heritage value, rather than demolishing them and rebuilding new ones in their place. So we have heard from some architects that uh, to actually uh, demolish an entire building and rebuild is actually uh, uses up a lot of carbon, right? There's a lot of effort put into it. And some of this could be reduced by actually thinking of creative ways in which we can reuse old buildings by renovating, rejuvenating them and so on. Another thing that we can think about doing is, um, do we really need that new building, right? Where Bill Heritage is concerned. Uh, as far as possible, can we safeguard the existing natural environment and wildlife um, instead of, of basically clearing them and then using it to replace it with an urban area? So we need to be thinking more about whether we can preserve some of these nature areas rather than just turn them into urban areas as well. And what about intangible cultural heritage? Can that help um, uh, to combat climate change? Well, um, it depends on the site, of course, but sometimes when you have um, intangible cultural heritage that's associated with a nature area, such as Bukit Brown Cemetery, which could be considered as a park, it's not really like an untouched nature area, but it's now uh, like a park. Um, you might say that the ICH that's associated with such places could lead to those areas being protected as cultural spaces in order to safeguard the ICH. So by protecting the intangible cultural heritage, you then also protect the space, which could be like a nature area. So that's one way in which the ICH could come into play. And in fact, some forms of ICH directly promote environmental sustainability. Um, I looked at the uh, list of intangible cultural heritage on UNESCO's website, and I thought this example was quite interesting. 
Be a tree beekeeping culture that is practiced in Belarus and Poland uh, was inscribed on this list uh, in 2020. So what is tree beekeeping? So tree beekeeping culture involves keeping wild beehives in logs or in trees in forest areas rather than in artificial hives. So the idea is that modern day, in, in, in modern times, a lot of times where people keep bees uh, for honey, um, they, they have these artificial hives and they actually take the, the bees out of the forest and, and put them in this hive near a farm and that's where they, they collect the honey. So the idea of tree beekeeping, which goes back uh, for, for many years, um, involves instead of having these artificial hives, you actually encourage the bees to make their hives into trees or into logs, uh, pieces of wood that you put in the forest. And the idea is to then recreate uh, the natural condition of bees in the wild and then they forage for wildflowers and things like that. So it's more a more natural way of, of beekeeping, I suppose. And you can see how um, this is a, a, a form of ICH that actually tries to promote more sustainability. You're not kind of producing a lot of honey on an industrial scales, probably smaller amounts of, um, of honey, but then maybe better for the environment, better for the bees and so on. So what about climate resilience? Uh, what's the idea of climate resilience? Climate resilience is the idea that we need to prepare for, adapt to, and recover from the impacts of climate change. So I think a lot of um, talk at the moment is how to slow down or even stop climate change, which I think we can all see is going to be really difficult. Uh, and therefore, even if we are able successfully to slow down climate change, there will be some effects of it and steps will therefore be needed to protect built and intangible cultural heritage from the effects of climate change, which is climate resilience. So some of the things that we will need to start thinking about will be issues like how to protect historic buildings and sites from the possible effects of climate change, such as hurricanes, rain, heavy rain, flooding and bushfires, and whether there are contingency plans um, in place in case a disaster happens. For example, if there is a fire or a flood, is there a plan in place for keeping museum artifacts safe or rescuing high value items? Have copies of rare documents been made and stored offsite so that in case a, a tragic uh, accident happens, you don't lose too much, right? And here's a very sad example. This is a photograph of the National Museum of Brazil in Rio de Janeiro. And I'm sure you would have read about it uh, burning down in September of 2018. Um, I think the um, cause was believed to be an electrical problem in an air conditioning unit, basically short-circuited and then led to a fire. So according to museum officials, about 92.5% of the collection has been destroyed, which is very tragic. Um, and this includes almost the whole, if not, uh, I think pretty much the whole of its collection relating to indigenous languages in Brazil and thousands of indigenous artifacts from the country's pre-Columbian Indo-American culture. And really a lot of this stuff is, is irreplaceable. There were recordings of languages that have gone extinct. Um, and, and so these are, if this is the only copy, then basically the record is lost. There is no more record of um, this language, at least from this particular museum. So it's really very tragic. And um, I also read that uh, a lot of indigenous people were unhappy that um, not enough money had been put into this museum to think of ways to maybe uh, digitize some of the collection and back it up and all that. Um, you know, it, it just, it was too, too little too late. Um, so we also need to think about issues relating to intangible cultural heritage. For example, are there types of intangible cultural heritage that are vulnerable to being lost if cultural spaces are damaged, like for example, the fire that broke out in this museum. What steps can be done to mitigate this? Can we um, speed up documentation efforts? Can we encourage transmission of practices to younger people so that the practice does not die out? Um, and what form of support will be needed uh, for practitioners of ICH um, if their livelihoods are affected by climate change? Will they need financial support, training, volunteers, and so on? So hopefully before um, anything that very serious happens, uh, some of these issues will need to be uh, thought about and we can start planning for it because it's likely to happen at some stage. 
All right, so finally, I'm just going to conclude with um, highlighting some of the challenges that uh, I think already have come up through the rest of the presentation. Protecting all heritage always has challenges. I think you can't really get away from that. Uh, for example, um, if we're talking about intangible cultural heritage, Singapore's population is largely an immigrant population. Um, a lot of our ancestors did not actually uh, um, uh, come from the island itself, but came from other countries and emigrated over the centuries and the decades to Singapore. Um, and therefore, we have very close cultural links to neighboring countries such as Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, uh, China, and so on. Um, and therefore, claims over what constitutes um, uh, ICH um, can be controversial. And I give one example. In 2009, uh, Malaysia's tourism minister at that time claimed that other countries, who she did not name, had hijacked some of the traditional Malaysian dishes. Um, however, the dishes that she claimed to be Malaysian are some of these which are also regarded by Singaporeans as Singaporean. So you will see photographs of uh, chili crab, uh, Hainanese chicken rice, uh, laksa, uh, nasi lemak, and um, uh, bakute, which is a pork bone soup. So uh, if you were to show these to Singaporeans, so a lot of Singaporeans would say, well, these are traditional Singaporean dishes, you know, and yet um, we do have other countries saying, no, no, these are our, our own um, uh, cultural dishes as well, and other countries should not seek to claim them. So fortunately, in fact, the, in the, uh, the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention does recognize that intangible cultural property often cannot be confined within the borders of one country. And it encourages countries to propose multinational inscriptions. Uh, just now, I told you about the uh, tree beekeeping. It was a joint nomination by Belarus and Poland because it happens in both those countries. Another good example is the Mediterranean diet, which was put on the register in 2013. And this was actually a joint subscription by many countries, Cyprus, Croatia, Spain, Greece, Italy, Morocco, Portugal, right? So you can have something, a form of untouchable culture that's shared by many countries. And there's no reason why these countries cannot all come together and say, we'll do a joint nomination because it's basically the same thing. Another challenge is that economic development is often given higher priority than protecting heritage. Um, and so we need to, I think, rethink this about whether or not um, this is something that always outweighs protecting heritage, or is there some way in which you can balance development and heritage? Um, I mentioned just now the possibility of legally restricting uses of built heritage to protect the ICH. Seems like a good idea, but of course uh, there are some challenges. This may conflict with the principle of adaptive reuse of buildings. So the idea is that um, it is not always feasible or possible to keep a building, um, you keep using it for its original purpose. The original purpose may have gone, it may not be economically viable to get someone to continue the original purpose and so on. And therefore you have this idea of adaptive reuse, which is that you try and preserve the building, um, the way it looks and so on, but you use it for other purposes, right? So if you, let's say, restrict the, the building to say, no, no, you can only use it as a church, then it may be that the building, no one will be interested in, in running it. Um, and therefore the building then becomes derelict and falls into disrepair, which is also not, not a very good solution, right? Uh, so if you've got these restrictions on the use of the buildings, then the buildings may become less attractive to developers or pe lessees, people want to rent them, and this may result in a fall in value and so on, right? So maybe we need to have a combination of restrictions and incentives to encourage voluntary adherence to recommended uses. You know, just sort of uh, encourage people rather than, than uh, make it mandatory, perhaps. So. Ultimately, I think if a nation's people are not to feel dislocated or that they have lost their identity, uh, some way of accommodating both heritage and progress has to be found. Um, if you take the attitude that no development is always the most important and therefore heritage is always disappearing and being replaced by something new, then you may get the, um, the, the, the kind of the backlash, which is that people say, well, I don't recognize anything from my country. I don't feel uh, th that this is a, uh, I don't feel a sense of home, right? And, and this is uh, undesirable because if anything bad happens then people will just leave and no one will be, will be willing and interested to, to continue um, doing things for the good of the country. Uh, so, and then finally, as I mentioned, climate change is going to affect heritage. So we need to start thinking about how built and intangible cultural heritage can help to slow down climate change and how we can prepare built and intangible cultural heritage for climate resilience. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so this is just some information um, um, about the Singapore Heritage Society. Um, if <laughs> I suppose if you're in Singapore and you are interested in becoming a member, uh, you can visit that link. We also have a Facebook site. We also have an Instagram site you can visit. And if you like, you can also uh, support us by giving a, a tax deductible donation, either from this website called giving.sg or using, if you're in Singapore, you can use this pay now um, QR code as well. Also, I have actually written an article about some of the things I've talked about today. Um, this is uh, this was published last year. So if you'd like to um, uh, have a look at the article, which is a legal article, so it might be slightly technical, but if you're interested, you can uh, again visit the website and download the article as well by using this QR code. I'll also um, put it in the chat later on. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you found that interesting and I think we will now take some questions. Um, thank you very much, Jack. Uh, this leaves us, uh, and thank you very much for giving us so much, uh, so many things to think about. I, I really appreciate your uh, the points you raised about, uh, you know, the legal protections for built heritage um, uh, with the conservation uh, guidelines and EIA. Uh, and I think you also really uh, hit the nail on the head, right, when talking about, uh, you know, the the how the legal protections uh, for intangible cultural heritage may not necessarily be there, but there may be uh, things that we can think about, such as uh, compatible use. Um, I, I also think that this uh, question of adaptive uh, reuse is actually a, an excellent opportunity for people to also think about who participates in the assessment and appraisals of mm -hmm. uh, what makes adaptive reuse or, or com compatible use. Um, so I have so many questions questions, but I know we have plenty of opportunities to chat. Uh, so I'd like to maybe uh, uh, turn to the questions that's actually in the Q&A. Um, and um, uh, so we can spend the next 10 minutes uh, addressing them. So we have one question uh, from someone in the audience. Uh, and this has to do with how uh, government agencies can work together to better support heritage. Um, um, and uh, this person gave the example of SLA, right, um, who actually looks after um, actually many her heritage buildings, but they seem to maybe work on, on their own, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's uh, uh, definitely a good idea that the heritage message be spread to uh, oops, the question has disappeared. Sorry, I see it now. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, that different government agencies become more appreciative of the need to protect heritage. Um, I think one thing that we want to try and get our governments to avoid is for each ministry to be a, a silo, what they call a silo. That means if my ministry is about transport, then I only think about transport. Um, and I think that's a, uh, uh, not a very good idea because a lot of activities of some of these ministries is going to impact on heritage, right? And we have seen, for example, that um, uh, the transport ministry, if it's going to build a highway or it's going to build a, 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 a train line, it can very often cut through nature or cut through a heritage building. And if they don't then think about issues about, oh, should we reroute the route in order to avoid damaging the heritage or the nature, then the heritage and nature is, is going to always going to be on the suffering end. So it cannot be something that is um, limited to the heritage agency will look at that. It's got to be the heritage agency hopefully encouraging its other sister agencies to think about how to also protect the heritage and have that conversation on, on how to do it. And I think um, um, uh, we've gone some way in doing that. Uh, but it uh, can certainly be improved for those ministries that don't traditionally deal with heritage. Yeah, okay. uh, thanks, Jack. And, mm -hmm. and uh, just to, you know, um, uh, add on, and I, I think it also is about um, uh, keeping conversations going, right? Uh, when mm -hmm. uh, issues uh, come up, right? Um, having actually multiple stakeholders uh, that goes beyond the agencies actually talking to each other, but also civil society, actually raising these issues and um, working together to, to yeah. address them. I, I think that will keep people working together. That's, mm -hmm. that's my take. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another question about uh, privately owned uh, heritage mm. buildings. And I'm wondering yeah. if you have thoughts about that. Mm. <clears throat> um, yes, so I think if a building is privately owned, then 
um, hopefully owners will become more interested in heritage and therefore be interested to see um, whether or not they can preserve the building uh, rather than just have it knocked down and, and rebuilt. Um, if let's say the owner does not necessarily recognize that, um, then it becomes a little bit challenging. Sometimes what can happen is that uh, other people who recognize the value in the building can petition, uh, the, at least in Singapore, right, can petition the uh, relevant authorities to either have the building declared to be a conservation area or as a uh, national monument. Um, I think it depends very much on the, uh, the building itself and whether it's, it, you know, it, it's significant uh, architecturally or historically and so on. Um, and I think this is, uh, it relates in a sense to the, the next question. So I'll try and answer them together, which is the next question is, what can everyday lay people do as individuals to help uh, face these challenges? So one of the things is that if let's say you as an individual care very much about um, heritage that's in your neighborhood, for example, uh, but the actual owners of the building are not so concerned and actually <laughs> quite keen to you know, knock it down and have it rebuilt. Um, if, if you can form an interest, an informal interest group with other people who are also interested in preserving the building, and you can show that there is a kind of a constituency, a group of people who are really interested and, uh, and see the value in this building, and then you approach the, the necessary authorities um, or even the owners of the building, they may be more persuaded to um, recognize that this building maybe ought to be preserved in some way. Um, I think it's a lot easier to say, hmm, you know, we should really think about doing something about a particular site when there is a group of people behind it and showing that they are interested in it. Um, and I, I'm thinking, for example, of some old uh, school buildings in Singapore uh, which were privately owned, of course, uh, and then uh, sold to developers. But because the alumni, the former students of the school, really, really, you know, wanted to, to preserve something of their old school building, they all came together and then they approached the authority, they approached the owners, and in the end, uh, it was agreed that some of the more older, more distinctive buildings would be kept, even though uh, integrated into part of the, of the new development, but nonetheless not knocked down, right? And similarly, I understand that there is a group of people who are interested in saving uh, the former Farrah Park and Farrah swimming pool um, in Singapore. It's, it's quite old now, but then they say that, you know, this, this uh, old sports center has been around for a long time. A lot of our uh, famous athletes train there and all that. And so therefore they came together and are speaking to authorities to try and get some part of it uh, retained, even though there is slated to be some redevelopment of roads and, and uh, buildings in the area as well. So yeah, I think uh, individuals can definitely be interested in, in heritage um, and then it can be a more ground up thing rather than just waiting for the authorities to say, okay, I think we should preserve this building and that building. Because if you show that there's a uh, interest, then um, the authorities are more likely to say, okay, we should do something about this. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, uh, that's yeah. a, a really good. Um, I really like this question about what the <laughs> yeah. <can do. laughs> right instead of like what can the government do. <laughs> um, okay, and, and I think uh, there's a couple more questions. Um, I may uh, try to read out a few of them so so we can get through them uh, at the same time. So I think uh, there is a a question about um, uh, how do we make ordinary people care more about heritage. I think this is uh, related to that question yeah. just now, what can the individual do, right? So that it's not just, uh, heritage does not just become something that um, uh, enthusiast activists or, or just uh, an elite group of people care about. Um, how do we make people understand why heritage is important? Mm. Um, and I, I really like the links that you drew uh, to climate change and climate resilience as well, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, another question re relates to uh, intangible cultural heritage, and this is about language, mm. uh, local language mm. that's diminishing uh, slowly, right? Uh, because the younger generation, they speak more and more English, mm. right? Um, maybe a bit of Chinese, right? Uh, and uh, I, I think this is from someone that's staying in Malaysia and is concerned about mm. um, the Malay language that's diminishing, right? Um, so on this yeah. note, actually, I just want to say that even Chinese is also diminishing, right? Um, or, or rather changing, right? Uh, adapting and changing, yeah. Yeah, mm. uh, yeah that, I mean, I mean, I, I don't have an answer for that. I think it's, it's, a, it's a difficult issue. Um, um, it probably needs 
cooperation of both uh, the government as well as um, uh, individuals who are interested because a lot of times language loss uh, happens in my, in, you know, from what I understand, because of a lack of official support for it, right? In some cases, um, governments have actually actively promoted policies that sideline certain languages. Um, sometimes these are for you know, good reasons. Sometimes it's not so good. The, the reason that they actually want to actively suppress certain aspects of a certain co a community's culture. Um, so in that kind of situation, I think it's very difficult, right? Unless you can, yeah. can change the, get the policy changed in some way. Um, I mean, in a sense, in Singapore, um, there was a push by the government to encourage the use of Mandarin. Um, and so for a, a long time, and in fact, I think it's still the case now, uh, programs that were in other Chinese languages other than Mandarin, for example, Hokkien, Cantonese, and all that, were taken off the airways. We don't have them on television anymore. We, we have very limited programming in uh, such dialects dialects uh, on the radio and things like that. And this, of course, then makes it very difficult for people to um, continue to, to stay in touch with the language. So until the policy changes and there is more content available and the teaching of such languages, then it, it will be very hard. So I think that that have, uh, needs to happen. But an example in Singapore, which I think is very positive, is that um, many people uh, who are Eurasian um, have begun to be interested in their traditional language, Kristam, which is, I think, a combination of Portuguese and Malay and, and, and uh, other local languages. And so they have actually organized themselves into classes to learn Kristang. And so there's been a bit of a resurgence of, of uh, Kristang speaking uh, among Eurasian. Uh, so uh, this is something which I guess the communities can, can try and do for themselves, even if there's, for example, we don't have any Kristang TV programs on TV and so on, right? But at least you can, you know, this is something that the community can do for itself. Mm. And, and just to add on, I've come across uh, uh, research projects mm. that tries to uh, digitally uh, document mm. uh, disappearing languages, right? Uh, so yeah. uh, from a preservation uh, perspective, yeah. it is uh, possible, but uh, yeah. something like language, I think really it's about yeah. the practices, right? And how, yeah. how language is embedded in the everyday vernacular language, as well as, um, yeah, like you said, media and, and uh, content learning of curriculum and yeah. so on. So um, I- Documentation I, is, is, is great. I think it's a great idea, but of course, you know, when you reach the stage of documentation, it means that the language is really dying. Yeah. There are very yeah. few speakers left and you just want to like record some yeah. trace of it, you know? Hopefully you get to a stage where you don't really need to just do a documentation uh, 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 pro project because, yes. you know, you want it to be living, <laughs> you want there to be more and more speakers or at least younger people speaking them and so on. And not that yes. it is something that is left to the down, the, the last 10 speakers and therefore you got to do a recording or it will disappear forever because that's, it's necessary yeah. but very sad, right? It's quite a sad situation yeah. to be in. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. But one yeah. thing that I noticed uh, with uh, some young people mm -hmm. in Singapore is this interest, in, in, this surgence uh, of interest in dialect, learning dialects, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I, I've seen how, yeah, they take uh, on courses and they teach each other as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we can uh, go to the yeah, the, the next question, uh, which is, I, I think, um, uh, mm. talking about how do we make ordinary people care more about heritage? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so again, I think that uh, it's probably better to, to, well, one, not better, but one way would be to start uh, from a local point of view and to encourage people to think about what are the um, sites and maybe also practices, um, intangible cultural heritage practices uh, that they see around the place where they live that they, that they find very interesting or they find very valuable to keep. And then um, to see whether they can do something to be more involved in therefore promoting, preserving and sharing that with others. Mm. Um, we've begun to see in Singapore uh, people interested in their own neighborhoods. And I think a good example is the My Queenstown uh, movement, I guess you could, you could say. You know, it started with a, with a group of individuals who recognized that um, 
the neighborhood was changing a lot, that there was a lot of redevelopment going on. And they wanted to then show people uh, what old Queenstown used to be like. Um, you know, and they've got, now got a community museum. And I think the government's also encouraging other people to set up community museums. Um, and uh, uh, the, the uh, Heritage Authority has issued um, a series of booklets about historic walks you can take around neighborhoods in Singapore and look at interesting things. So these are all things which I think uh, ordinary people can, uh, can do to promote uh, heritage in their own areas. And of course, when you start with that, then they may move on to things which are not necessarily in their own area and are maybe of national interest as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Jack. And mm -hmm. I, I think uh, this this is uh, really uh, is a great question, and I I think uh, I, I fully agree with you. I think sometimes um, we think of when we think of the word uh, come across the word heritage, we tend to think of oh only the most important, right? But what is important, right? Uh, so it has yeah. to do with our understanding of what is uh, heritage as well. Um, okay, in the interest of time, uh, I. Um, I'm sorry we won't be able to get through, uh, finish all the questions um, because yeah, I, I, I think we're supposed to end like five minutes ago. Uh, but in the interest of time, uh, maybe let me just go to one last question we has, which has to do with uh, one of the points you made about impact assessment. Uh, and this okay. question came, comes from Fabian um, and uh, he asked, how has legal requirements for heritage impact assessment work? to preserve heritage monuments in Asia, right? For instance, Hong Kong, right? Yeah. Um, how, is, does HIA, right, uh, is, is uh, you know, is it gaining traction uh, in governmental yeah. circles? Uh, and yeah. yeah, specifically as in uh, the Singapore context? Yeah, um, it's hard to say. I mean, we know, for example, that it's not a legal requirement at the moment. So initially, at the moment, if let's say you are interested in redeveloping um, a building, all you need to do is put in an application to the Urban Redevelopment Authority. And I don't think it requires a heritage impact assessment as a cause. Um, it, you know, maybe they will be asked for it in some cases or not, but it's not routinely asked for. So um, what is the value of having some kind of either heritage impact assessment or environmental impact assessment? I think the idea is that it is hard to make a decision when you don't really know what could be the impact of um, the development in question, right? Let's say you want to um, knock down a building and uh, rebuild something new in its place. If you didn't realize that the building was actually, um, let's say the former headquarters for an Oakland association and nobody bothered to go and do research and find out what it was, then of course the approval might just be given and then you might find out too late that, oops, actually, you know, it, it had some value and we really should have thought about how we could keep it. Um, but because no one was aware, uh, because no one had been required to do the research, then it was just lost. So you don't, you want to, the idea of these impact assessments is to try and avoid being in that situation and going into making the decision with open eyes. So at least you know, okay, someone's done a study, someone's done research, this is what the impact is going to be. At the end of the day, it might be that, okay, a decision has made that, well, it does have some heritage value or some environmental value, but it is more important to have this building. Um, so we are going to approve it anyway. Okay, but then at least you went into the decision with your eyes open and you know you don't go into it by mistake. So I guess that's the, the benefit of, of having some kind of impact assessment in that you, you are making sure that these things don't, um, un, uh, uh, these decisions aren't made on the basis of lack of information, you at least know that this is happening. So I think that um, uh, it, it has worked in, in other countries as well, where these things are more um, required as a, as, as a cause. Um, yeah, I, I, of course, there are challenges in implementing such a scheme, because if you're going to make this a, a requirement, then you're going to need people who can conduct these things, right? And at the moment, the question becomes, do we have expertise in Singapore? Um, or even if we do have expertise, are there enough companies that are offering services to do this? If there's only like one or two, and suddenly they get a flood of like 50 applications coming in all requiring this thing, then they may not be able to cope, right? So a kind of infrastructure needs to be built up um, that, that would enable these kind of impact assessments to be conducted and carried out as well. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, thank you, Jack. Um, we are 10 minutes over time, uh, and I'm okay. sorry to everyone who posed questions, but uh, I, we weren't able to get to them. Uh, but uh, please uh, keep uh, your uh, comments and, and feedback coming. Uh